For our interview for this episode, uh, I talked to Paul DeBevic, who leads the Graphics Laboratory at the University of Southern California's Institute for Creative Technologies. Paul created something called Light Stages, which uh, you'll see kind of in the background of this interview. It's basically this big kind of metal globe that has all these lights and cameras around it. And the idea is that it captures an actor's face from all angles in any number or any type of light situation. It then uses this information to create a, uh, a digital replica of a human face as photoreal as possible. You've probably seen uh, Debevic's work in, uh, in Spider-Man 2. He did a lot of work on Doc Ock. Um, also in Superman Returns, which uh, hopefully you didn't see, although the work is very good. But I think really sort of their crowning achievement is uh, the curious case of Benjamin Button, where they created all of the effects to put a old Brad Pitt's head on a child's body, as well as a lot of the other aging effects uh, that couldn't be done just with makeup. In the documentary, The Pixar Story, John Laster says, quote, the art challenges technology, technology inspires the art. Uh, I think that what they're doing uh, with light stages is really a great example of that, where they've created this technology to try to create as best as possible a photoreal CG face. While I'd seen uh, some of the some of Debevic's work in, in movies, uh, I was a little unclear what the sort of, what he thought the, the kind of final result is that he's going for, and his answer actually is really pretty interesting. So anyway, uh, let's take a look at my interview with Paul Debevic. So can you explain sort of what your, uh, what is it that you do? Well, I work at the University of Southern California's Institute for Creative Technologies in the graphics laboratory, and we're trying to create computer graphics technology that will enable the next generation of virtual reality. And one of the ways we're going to get there is in the very charter of our institute is to collaborate with the entertainment industry, visual effects and video games, who have some great groundbreaking technologies they come up with frequently, mix it within the academic research that we can do, and then create technologies that will be relevant to the future of all kinds of virtual reality for entertainment, uh, education, and training. How would you describe sort of the ultimate goal of what, of what you'd like to see with, the, with this technology? I'd, I'd basically like to see it so that we have the tools that can realize you know, any vision of any storyteller, ideally on any budget. Right now, you know, what does it take to be able to, to pull off you know, a feature film and direct a movie? You know, very few individuals have that kind of gravitas and connections and, and, and character to make that happen. And that's a very small segment of the people who have very interesting stories to tell. Uh, when we have the technology so that you know, a small group of collaborative people, you know, maybe sitting in a little office room next to uh, a small motion capture stage, can, you know, through downloading props through libraries, through having high dynamic range panoramic images of their environments, through performance capture of, you know, people who may or may not look exactly like the character that you want them to play. Be the computers can render them to look any way that they want. And pull off, you know, epic filmmaking on the scale of Avatar for a couple hundred thousand bucks of investment rather than a couple hundred million then I think we'll really have something that is going to be a transformative tool for visual communication. And I'm hoping we get there in the next decade or two. And I, like, I'm, I'm very curious about this, uh, this idea of, of, of kind of imbuing digital characters with, with soul. And, and I mean, I, I think that obviously with, with humans, there's, you know, there's the uncanny valley problem, and which is saying that uh, like a company like Pixar gets around by using, not having photorealistic humans mm -hmm. that much. Um, but I, I was wondering whether their ability to, to breathe so much life and emotion and soul into their characters, if, if there's a technological thing they're doing that other people aren't, or whether it's just they really just care about the story at all, or is it a combination? Well, Pixar certainly has uh, some of the best technologists in the business and always had. I mean, Ed Catmull, did, the president of Pixar now, I mean, he started as a, as a graduate student at the University of Utah just doing a little, you know, 3D models of his hand opening and closing. He has kept, you know, technical excellence at that company all the way through. At one point, you know, only they had the tools to pull off certain kinds of shots uh, in animated films. The reason it was a success, though, is not because they just had great technology, it's because they had great artistry, most importantly, great storytelling, but also they firmly believed in the power of 2D animation. John Lasseter uh, went to CalArts. He studied with some of Disney's famous nine old men animators. He knew everything there was to know and it was completely proficient in two-dimensional animation. When he got to Pixar, it was a matter of figuring out how does everything good about traditional animation translate 
into the three-dimensional world. And they found ways, like if a ball bounces, it needs to squash and stretch. In computer rendering, you know, you just, the equation of a sphere is simple. The way that it bounces uh, is, a, is a parabola. That's a simple equation. If you watch it, it doesn't look very exciting. The ball has no character and no soul. So if you make it so that, you know, actually squashes down for a moment and then actually springs up a little bit too fast according to physics, we like watching that a lot more. The characters in Pixar movies do all of this kind of thing. Pixar would more quickly hire somebody who's a great artist traditionally who's never touched a computer and train them on all the technology than to take somebody who knows all the technology and try to train them to be an artist. That's the much harder process to go through. And they've built their company out of people who are proficient in the technology, but really the artistry and the creativity and, and the storytelling is what's driven everything. But it leverages all the best technology that there is to offer. I was wondering what, what has kind of surprised you about what it has taken to make something lifelike or soulful or, or emotional. Okay. So, so far there's been two ways of creating a believable emotive performance that you actually see that's not just you know filming a real person with a real camera. That's a good actor. You can animate it or you can do it with uh, performance capture. And in fact, you can't just do it with performance capture. You need to animate on top of that to actually get something that's going to work. Uh, everyone's very excited about the performance that Andy Serkis provided the performance capture data for in Rise of the Apes, playing the lead ape of Caesar. And Andy Serkis is almost certainly the best actor for doing performance capture work that's out there. You look at the video of what he did to, that got captured and provided reference for what the Weta's animators did, it's extremely impressive work. It doesn't mean that Weta could just take that and put it up on the screen. The technology isn't there yet, and also the process of really transforming a human being into an ape. Andy Serkis was doing a lot of that, but their animators are doing the rest of it too, and it's a whole team of people creating that performance. You can also just animate it all frame by frame. Pixar doesn't quite do it frame by frame, they do it on keyframes and then computers interpolate things. But those performances are done uh, not using motion capture techniques. It's an animator adjusting the trajectories of this arm to this frame to this arm to this frame. They look at themselves in a mirror for reference of what the faces should do and maybe how they'll time. But they're really creating it, you know, like sculpting uh, or, or modeling out of clay. That has worked very well for non-photorealistic characters, uh, like you know, Carl in Up uh, or, or Woody in Buzz. We haven't seen a lot of people using that process to drive a photoreal human face that has you know, skin pores and fine creases and shiny lips and wet eyeballs and all of that. The, just the expectations for what you see out of something that you believe is a real human are just very different than what you know when you see you know, a big-eyed cartoon character in glorious movie lighting. Where this is all going is like, how can you do it without literally having a person create it with their own performance or having animators painstakingly create it in animation? Then we'll really have something we can truly call a digital actor because you'll have some sort of artificial intelligence that might rely on a huge database of uh, performances that, that an actor has given or different actors have given over time and be able to blend together and create new kinds of motions based on different kinds of emotions that they might want to have saying a line. And you'll actually be able to create that performance without it literally having to be done by somebody. Those tools are probably you know, a decade of development uh, away to actually be useful and to create good results. Uh, but people are working on the problem. There's going to be a lot of really interesting things to learn interesting things to learn about what makes a good human performance. But it's going to be a very useful tool. It's going to allow that storyteller working with a small group of collaborators in front of computers to have every single scene read exactly the way that they want it to. You're, you're so uh, committed to what you shot in principal photography. You can choose this take or that take and sometimes you can get clever and use the beginning of this take and morph to the end of that take. But if that performance isn't working well in that shot once you're seeing the sequence before and the sequence after and where now you really understand the story needs to move through, you know, you're kind of stuck. You can't, it's too expensive to bring everybody back into the studio and your sets have already been, you know, put in the dumpsters at that point. When the digital techniques are there, you can create any performance and direct it a little bit this way or a little bit that way. I think we're going to get films that 
are going to look like absolute masterpieces because every single part, you know, the author of that has been able to do exactly what he or she wanted to do rather than you know, all of the brilliant compromises that have to be strung together to make a film today. If you just shot a whole sequence and it was that way and it was in that lighting, you can't just decide, oh, I wish that sequence was at night now or I wish the light was a little bit different. You can replace the sky. You can do a lot of things, but you can't really just, you know, start over. I think one of the reasons that every Pixar movie, other than Cars 2, <laughs> was at like 99% on Rotten Tomatoes is that in animation you can actually, you know, throw things out and redo it. And, you know, your sets didn't disappear. They're just sitting on a hard drive somewhere. It's really possible, you know, to storyboard it. And their process where they go from storyboarding uh, to, to, to blocking, to, to layout, to rough animation, to lighting, to final animation, they can go back and change anything anywhere. It's, it's expensive, but it can be done in ways that you just can't do it in principal photography. And no live action studio has that kind of string of hits that Pixar has had. It's because it's all digital and you can go back. You can't do that for live action right now. In 10 years, you'll be able to. Just imagine how awesome it'll be if, 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 uh, if, if Sony or, or MGM or Universal could have the reliable track record of hits that, that Pixar has. I think they jump at that.